This meeting is being recorded. Hello, I am honoured to have the lovely Neil with me. Um, hi, Neil, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Hiya, um, Neil Broadfoot. I've been here before, I think. Um, I am the author of eight books now, five in the Connor Fraser series and three in the Doug and Susie series, which is set in Edinburgh. Um, and I've just brought this one out, Violent Ends, which is the new Connor Fraser book set in Stirling. Fabulous. Uh, did you always know that you wanted to write? <laughs> yeah, that, it's all I ever wanted to do. It kind of the desire to write was what kind of pushed me into being a journalist for so many years because um, I wanted to work with words until I got, you know, out into the world and um, writing books. But yeah, this is all I've ever really wanted to do. So it was never, there was never any question of me doing anything else. It was always, I was going to write, how was I going to make a, a living until I managed to get published? And journalism was the answer to that question. And then what happened and why did you decide to write fiction instead of being a journalist? Well, I've always loved storytelling. I've always loved writing stories. Um, and how it all came about, how I ended up getting published was when I was a kid, I promised my grand that I'd write a book and dedicate it to her. Um, and she passed away before that would happen. That happened in life, got in the way, and you know, kids, marriage, job, career. And I kind of forgot about the promise. And then something happened that reminded me of it. I saw an old family video of a, bar a family barbecue. And when I saw it, I realized that I'd forgotten the sound of my grand's voice. And I don't know what that did to me, but it did something that was a case of, right, that, honor that promise is getting honored, it's getting honored. Now, let's do this. And I was in a foul mood walking <laughs> off to, in my lunch break from the Scotsman, racking my brain, how am I going to write a book? How am I going to do this? And I looked up and I saw the Scott Monument and it was a beautiful sunny day, all these people sitting having lunch underneath it. And in my foul mood, I thought, I'm going to throw somebody off that. So I wrote the first scene of the body landing in amongst all these people, um, wrote the first scene. And then I just kept on going. And from there, the following fast, which was my first novel, which got picked up and shortlisted for what was the Deanston, which is now the McIlvany Award at Bloody Scotland. And then it just kind of went from there. And I've written a book a year since 2014. Um, when you sat down and started, you had that scene in your mind, but then did they follow easily after that? Or did you struggle to think, oh my God, how am I going to write 100,000 words of a book? Well, I didn't know what I was doing because um, I don't plan or plot. I just go with it. Um, I had a scene and then I approached it of, okay, if that's happened, how would you investigate that and what comes next? And I just basically, the old saying of you're either a pantser or a plotter. I fly by the seat of my pants and just run. Um, and then, what, 90,000 words later, I had a book. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't advise it. It's not the most calming way of doing things, but it's the way that I can, it's the only way I can work. Yeah, um, I've just finished the first draft of my book. And All right, congrats. Thanks. And yeah, it just, I made it so hard for myself, but I couldn't have done it any other way. So, but yeah. I didn't write it in order. I didn't plan it. It was an absolute nightmare to put together, but there we are. It's done now. It's fine. Oh, well, congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so now just whatever else follows. I'm not looking forward to that bit, but yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what was I just going to ask you? Um, do you do a lot of research? And what's the most interesting thing you found out while researching? <clears throat> um... Yeah, I mean, again, because I don't plan, I research as I go. Um, for example, this one, I had to do a lot of research on fire and procedures about entering a building that's on fire and drones of all things. Um, so, yeah, the, the key to research is you might find it endlessly fascinating and you might go down a rabbit hole, but then you've got to pull it back and not make it a treat, not make the book a treatise on the life cycle of the Patagonian fruit fly or whatever that you found fascinating, but you know the reader just doesn't really want to know about it. Um, as for the most interesting thing, I don't know. Um, I think the most interesting thing would be if the police ever sees my laptop and saw my Google search history. <laughs> There's everything from how long does it take for somebody to bleed out to what's the best way to burn somebody alive to what's the best way. <laughs> 
<laughs> grind up on, you know. So, like all writers, I've got a kind of patchy Google history. Um, but yeah, I mean, the thing is that whenever, whatever you're working on at the time, for me anyway, is the most interesting thing you're working on. And then the next thing will come along, and the next book that I do, I'll research something different, and that will be the most fascinating fact I've ever found, and then so on and so on. So, you know, it just depends on what I'm going to be researching next. Do you hide any Easter eggs in your books? Sometimes. Um, you know, I, I, I make reference to people that I know. Um, in this one, actually, there's a very blatant Easter egg, and uh, a pal of mine, a great guy called Dave Philp, who I worked with, um, I needed some tech, as we were talking about the Jones and stuff, some tech. But Dave's very good at technical stuff. But the best thing about Dave is he's very good at taking what is hugely technical and making it very, very accessible. Um, so he's actually, he makes a cameo in the book. Uh, so there's that kind of Easter egg, but there's, you know, there's nods to other characters, there's nods to people, there's nods to places. So yeah, yeah, that's part of the fun. Yeah, absolutely. Um, which of your characters gave you most trouble writing them? Oh God, all of them at certain times, because as I say, I don't plot and I don't plan, so they end up doing things that I don't want them to do. Um, it's the old Ian Banks thing that Ian Banks said that you know, he was the god of the world when he was writing a book and his characters would do exactly what he would tell them to do and he knew a book was working when the characters started talking back. So I've had that. Um, they've all given me certain headaches at certain times, but the flip side is they do something that you don't want them to do, but then they flip it around and you do something that's really fun to write. So, you know, it, it goes with the territory. Have you ever given any of your series characters a quirk in book one that you've regretted later on? Oh, God. Um, I suppose Connor's, Connor's obsession with the gym and obsession with learning how to fight and stuff is problematic because you've got to try and find new ways of making that part of the character but not making it boring. Oh, he's off to the gym again. Oh, he's beating the crap out of somebody again. Oh, he's learning this again. Oh, God, here we go. <laughs> So try to find, and, but the thing the thing with series characters is you put quirks in to start with, but then as the series grows, you get to know the characters more, so more quirks come out. So there, you know it's a layering process of book one you get to know the character and how they work in the world, then book two is oh there's a little more three four five and then off you go. Mm -hmm. So the good thing about writing series characters is you do get to know them better, and they do if you're doing it right, and hopefully I am. They do expand out and they do become more formed and complete as you go along. Yeah, the reason that I asked that question is I saw Ellie Griffiths wrote that um, her character, Ruth, she wrote, yeah. I think, in book one that she didn't wear jeans. And she's like, why? Why did I write that? Of all the things to give my character, why would they not wear jeans? <laughs> yeah, so, so I was interested if anyone else done that. Um, uh, it's quite funny. Um, and are you a visual writer? Do you see scenes in your head and write them down? Sometimes. I mean, sometimes that's all I've got to go with is, for example, falling fast. I had this thought of somebody coming off the top of the, the Scott Monument. And another one of my books had this image of somebody getting snipered through a window looking out on Arthur's scene. For all the lawyers who are watching this, I have to say that was completely fictional. Um, you know, sometimes it, it'll be that or it'll be a line that grabs you or a saying or something or a news headline. It, it, there's no really one thing, but yeah, sometimes I do get visual flashes of wouldn't it be great if that or it'll be a line or whatever. It just, I've spoken about this before with Craig Russell, um, that writers have the kind of antenna all the time and we're looking for things and you never know what's going to actually trigger you and set you off down the path of thinking about a book so it's just whatever's out there I think the key thing is you just got to be open to it and you know be curious about things which will then make you think about certain situations in a certain way and then hopefully trigger a book. You must have had that as a journalist anyway you you because you've always got to be um you know looking for a story and stuff haven't you so you must have sort of had that you know um, antenna anyway. 
Yeah, I mean, journalism, you know, it's not rocket science. It is a kind of formula, but I think one of the good things that journalism does is it takes the mystique away from writing for a bit. Because I always say that writing is a job that never feels like work, but at the end of the day, it is a job. And I guess what journalism done, it does is, A, it trains you to look for the news line in something. Like, you know, one of my jobs when I was a news editor was you would look at what was going on in the news schedule that day, look at all the newspapers and stuff, figure out what the most important story of the day was, and then try and guess as to where the story was going to go. So then you would report on that that way. So, yeah, I suppose it does. You know, journalism does kind of train you to look for interesting stories. And it also trains you to be disciplined of, if you need to write 2,000 words that day, you write 2,000 words that day. You don't sit there twiddling your thumbs, having a cup of tea and going, waiting for the news to hit. You write the 2,000 words. So, yeah, I suppose there is that, that it has trained you in a certain way. Do you procrastinate now? Because I know a lot of authors are the worst procrastinators in the world. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm procrastinating. I am also not saying the fact that the kitchen has never been tidier, the dog has been walked <laughs> off his little legs, um, my t-shirts are all folded and everything else. I'm not saying that those are connected at all. Oh, um, no. But yeah, I, I think like every writer, you do. You know, it's the old saying of, I hate writing, but I like having written. Yeah. So it's that, like, especially when you're in the position that I am, when you're at the early foothills of another book. But when you get more into it, you'll know it yourself from writing a book. But when you get more into it and when you're further into the story, it's easier to get into it. And usually because the deadline's screaming towards you at 100 miles an hour, you don't have time to procrastinate. Yeah, luckily I didn't have deadlines, so I procrastinated. That's why it's taken me a year. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you were to be a killer in a book, how would you kill your victims? I can't tell you that because then if something happens and you know I might have plans <laughs> to kill certain people <laughs> so I can't I couldn't possibly comment um I don't know I've killed people in some fairly unique and interesting ways I suppose it would depend on like the punishment fit the crime you know that type of thing which is a warning to everybody out there who's going to annoy me or something you know you never know <laughs> yeah <laughs> I don't know, it's all, you know, the way that I come up with deaths and murders and stuff is, God, I, I should preface this, just in case anybody's walking past the room, it's all fiction. Um, it, as I say, it's situational, you know, in the second book, or sorry, in the first corner book, I dumped a body at the Bowling Green at the top of Stirling where the football match is held, because I had that idea when I was there. Um, you know, in the second one, it was a retreat, a country hotel, so somebody obviously had to die in the woods horribly. In this one, you know, there's a lot of stuff about fires and it starts with somebody trapped in a fire. So obviously that was going to be situational. So it's just a case of, you know, whatever the story dictates and demands, that's what you slot in as a murder. And then you go off and research, as we were talking earlier on, about powdering bones or somebody bleeding out or burning or whatever it might be. You do the research on the spot and then you write it. Um, and if you were to be fictionally killed, who would you want to investigate your murder? Oh God. Um, if I was to be fictionally killed, who would? Connor, because he'd get revenge. <laughs> <laughs> See, very few writers say their own detectives. I always think that that should be like the answer that comes straight to mind, but they're like, eh, you know, Sherlock Holmes or someone. Very rarely they say their own. If I could go back in time, Lennox would be, Craig Russell's Lennox would be a good investigator. Or Laidlaw, or, yeah. There's a whole yeah, load of them, at least with Connor. I've, I've written him going back to the gym and stuff. I know that he could do the damage to whoever it was, so there would be retribution. Interesting, interesting uh, insight into your, how your mind works as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, when everyone reads the first chapter of my book, they might be quite, or the second chapter, they might be quite surprised. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I look forward to it. <laughs> uh, but when you're editing, what's your most overused word or phrase? Uh, my characters nod to an excessive amount. Connor nodded. Connor shrugged. It's a real pain in the neck. But yeah, nodding. That's the one that I always get. Uh, Connor nodded. Connor shrugged. Connor shrugged his jacket on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You get the edits back and you open it and it's like that scene from The Shining. You know, when you, when you open the email and 
it's like the elevator's opening and that sea of red comes towards you. <laughs> uh, you see that? And, uh, and then you read them, oh, yeah, you're right. I've done it again. Okay. Um, yeah. If you've not got a post it note by your computer that says, for God's sake, stop the nodding yeah. <laughs> and shrug it. Yeah, but then I, then I ignore it. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm getting better, but yeah, nodding is one of the, the most overused ones that I'm guilty of. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I love that. And everyone knows their words straight away, always. Yeah. Um, have you made lots of author friends since you started writing? Oh, God, yeah. Um, that's one of the nicest things about being a writer, actually, um, is you do make really, really good friends. Um, you know, I've formed some of the closest friendships in my life since I became a published author. And because of meeting people... You know, going to book festivals, going, you know, going on, or being invited along, and doing things, um, and meeting people and getting involved in that community and that network. Yeah, I've made lots of good friends um, from crime fiction, and it's one of the nicest parts of the job. And um, do you have a um, group of readers, and do you have a number one fan? A number one fan? You mean yeah. Annie Wilkes? Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to watch for her starting up at a festival. I love you so much. Um, <laughs> no, I, mean, I don't think I've got a number one fan. I've got, you know, people who are obviously keen in the work. Um, going back to what you were saying about friends being writers and stuff, there's an incredibly supportive network out there of you can bring stuff out to them and say, does this work? And then you can look at their stuff. So there's this kind of, you know, cross-pollination of you're always giving, you know, giving your work to somebody, they're giving it to you, and you're always having that chat. And it is a really nice and supportive network to have to know that there are I hate to call myself a professional but there are other professional writers out there who will give you an honest opinion they won't sugarcoat it you have sense of the and they'll come back with the yeah, so you're not doing it for the validation of just tell me that's great you're doing it and you get constructive feedback and that's one of the nicest things about being part of the right community um, what's the funniest or weirdest uh, review you've ever had or feedback <laughs> um, there was one on Amazon where I can't remember the full thing of it but it was I bought this because it was in a deal to 99p and the author was tasty but tasty so I thought I'd give it a try <laughs> now I am neither tasty nor tasty I am a typical Scot with the ginger recession in me and I am not tasty but yeah that was that was one that kind of hold me up but you, you can't you can't take reviews too seriously it's nice when folks say nice things about the books but opinions are like fill the phrase in yourself everybody's got one so you can't really take them it's the fine stuff that makes you laugh like that. <laughs> oh that's great i love that <laughs> not, yeah. not that readers are shallow or anything <laughs> Tasty, but tasty. I'm trying. To, I'm trying to persuade my publisher to get that on the covers. Actually, that'd be great. <laughs> it would sell. It would catch my eye for sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really tickled me. Um, <laughs> okay, if you were able to spend a day with any author, dead or alive, who would you like to spend a day with? Oh God, almighty. Um, good question. But the thing is, I get to do it. You know, I get to see my author pals. I get to spend the day with, you know, go for lunch with Craig Russell, you know, go out drinking of a night with Helen Fields, see Ed James and Derek Farrell, avoid Douglas Skelton and hope that the court order keeping him away from me is still in effect. <laughs> you, know, I, you know, so I am really lucky in that and my friends are authors, so I do get to spend time with them. Um, living or dead, meeting Stephen King would be a bucket list movie, because, you know, I grew up on carry and stuff and misery and you know um so that'd be a bucket list moment um but yeah I, i'm really lucky and i do get to meet you know authors whose work that i like and i get to spend time um, if you're able to go out for a drink with one of your characters who would you like to go out for a drink with uh probably connor because you'd be safe of an evening um <laughs> 
I, I don't know. Um, to be fair, if I went out for a drink with my characters, they'd probably end up beating the hell out of me for all the crap that I put them in. So, you know, <laughs> it wouldn't be a nice night out for them or for me. Um, but yeah, probably Con or Polly, because he'd get a few drinks and we'd be scared of them. Yeah, it sounds good. <laughs> Um, if you're able to travel to any period of time, either forwards or backwards, where would you go? Oh, God, good question. Um, I'd go forward because I want to get this year the hell over with because it's been a hell of a year. Um, but it'd be interesting to see, given all the chaos that's going on, whether we survive the next five years um, or whether Westminster's just this big glowing ember <laughs> where it all went wrong. Um, no, I'd go forward to see what's next. That ter the thought of that terrifies me too much. Um, just, yeah. Lucky if you couldn't have it. You couldn't, no. <laughs> I want to write a political thr thriller. Too far-fetched. Not going to work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know. Oh, yeah. If number 10 isn't burning by the end of this year, I'd be quite surprised, to be quite honest. <laughs> Oh, Given the way things are going, it might be the end of this week. <laughs> yeah. I mean, are we doing you the Prime Minister next week? Who knows? <laughs> no, they get one month, don't they? Is that not the thing? It's a rolling cycle of one month. Oh, is it a mm. month? Okay. <laughs> and also been there a week? I can't even keep up. <laughs> no. Who knows? Um, who was your first celebrity crush? You've asked me this before, and I couldn't think of it last time, and I can't even think of it this time. I know. Well, I don't. Um, I don't give in. <laughs> I don't forget either. First celebrity crush. God, I'm going to have to come back to you again on that because I can't. I've gone a complete blank. That I feel like saying something stupid like Miss Piggy just to kind of you know, just to give you an answer, but I can't even think of something. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'll come back to you on that one. Okay. I just so you know, I don't forget. It might be a year or more than a year, and I'd still haven't forgotten. So. I'll go away and rack my brains, and I'll probably come up with ten answers after. But again, blind Um, Death Row. What um are your final? What's your final meal? Ooh, um, good question again. A Chinese takeaway with a big file in it that I can get out. <laughs> Actually, there's quite an interesting idea. Could somebody on death row eat something that would make them immune to the lethal injection and then they could escape? There's an idea. I'll ask uh, Brian Price, he'll know. <laughs> I don't know if they'd tell me though. Apparently, I was watching a panel yesterday and they don't tell people everything just in case they, you know, yeah. have nefarious purposes for <laughs> information. Oh, I had to do that with this one. I had to kind of alter the alter the recipe for certain <laughs> flammable devices, so I didn't get into trouble. And I didn't do, you know, the guy who wrote Fight Club, Chuck Palahniuk, if that's how you pronounce it. He got a knock on the door from the FBI because he was talking about writing fertilizer bombs and stuff. Um, you know that? That yeah. Let's have a little chat about that. So I try not to do that. Yeah, quite a few of them said that they switched ingredients around or amounts or something so that people couldn't yeah. copy it. When I, I'd done a forensics degree, and when I'd done my degree, our lecturer wouldn't even tell us, her students, certain things or the whole process. It's like, we need students, we're here to learn. No, she wouldn't tell us. She, no yeah. matter how much we went on, she would not tell us. <laughs> no fun, honestly. I mean, what did she think we were there for? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but what's the strangest or funniest place you've ever woken up? The strangest or funniest place I've ever woken up? The strangest place I've ever woken up is Las Vegas. That place is just weird. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was on a... I had a pal who was working out there and we went out to see him and it was a, shall we say, riotous boys weekend? Yeah. So that Lots was, of alcohol that, involved. <laughs> I couldn't possibly comment. Yeah, did you end up naked anywhere? I don't know what it is when men always tell me about their stories, they get drunk and then they get naked. I mean, what is that? <laughs> Definitely not me. No, I've never got drunk and then woken up going, what? Or kind of walk down the strip naked. No. 
<laughs> We're talking about crime fiction here, not horror, so you know. <laughs> I wouldn't want to expose people to that. So, well, your yeah. reviewer would disagree, wouldn't she? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <sighs> um, what would those closest to you say your most annoying habits are? <laughs> Being a writer. Uh, you know, doing that strange wander off, muttering to myself. You know, <laughs> and it takes you three months because you don't plan. You know, you, you murder someone and then you've done it in a perfect locked room mystery. And you spend weeks walking around the house going, how the hell did I do that? Did that work? <laughs> Does that work? And they kind of give you that strange look of, you know, you're basically talking to yourself and muttering about murder and stuff. And, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I suppose there's that and my somewhat animated reaction to some of the news stories that you see recently. <laughs> um, are you working on anything at the moment and what's coming next for you? Uh, next is the next corner book, which is called Unmarked Graves, which will be, I've got to deliver it in February, so it'll be out in September, I think, next September. So I'm working on that. There's another two corner books coming. Uh, so I'm working on that at the moment. And then in between that, this is where it gets confusing because I'm working on that book, but I've got to talk about this book and then... You know, and then when the paperback of this comes out, then I've got to talk about that again. But I'll already be two books down the road. It, it, it all gets very confusing. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm working on at the moment. And I take on editing work as well. So I'm doing a couple of edits. It's like structural stuff and appraisal edits, um, stuff like that. So I'm doing that as well. Uh, do you just want to tell us about the book that you've held up most of the times, but we don't actually know anything about, except that it's got fire in it? <laughs> this is Violent Ends. It is... With a great cover, I've got to say, they've done a great job on the cover listing. Um, basically, this is the fifth Connor book, and it starts with Connor receiving a threat to his gran and his girlfriend, Jen. Somebody's taking pictures of them. And he's basically told, you have to protect... I'm going to... Sorry, the bad guy phones him and says, I'm going to kill this priest within the next seven days. You're going to protect him from me. And he pays 70 grand into Connor's business account to pay him to protect him. Connor gets involved and finds a conspiracy stretching back. And as usual, there's lots of nice visceral violence. Um, Polly turns up and all the normal good stuff that you would expect from a Connor book. And it's out now in hardback and audiobook narrated by Angus King. And the paperback is coming out May, I think, or March. And then month. <laughs> next year um, next year yeah we'll worry about that next year it's fine <laughs> um what uh are some of the top reads of this year for you top reads this year um god that's a tough question uh the institution by helen fields which is out next year i got an advanced proof of it um ian's latest uh heart full of headstones was great i just finished that uh, Razorblade Tears by Steve Sean Cosby. Yeah, um, was superb. Uh, what else? And An Honorable Thief by Douglas Skelton, and that hurt to say that. <laughs> um, it was absolutely cracking. I just want tips, basically. <laughs> I haven't read any of them, so. All oh, I could give you, yeah. My, my reading list and my two read list is, like every writer's, it's massive. Um, and of course, whenever I see a book, I'm just, oh, I'll just buy that. Yeah, you should see my, uh, well, I mean, I go to the festivals, so I get signed books and I have no way to put them. I don't know why I keep buying them, but, you know, <laughs> I just yeah. do. It's and just, I never read them. Well, that's the thing. I buy them and then I kind of work my way through them. But one of the lucky things, one of the nice things about being published again is publishers send you books for blurbs and stuff. So you get advanced previews of books that is just, you know, great because these things come through and you get a wee sneak peek of stuff. Yeah, I'm a blogger, so I get some. And then I'm on some author's blogger list, so that's quite cool. So I get some, but not loads, which is fine because I have no way to put them or time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't think I have any more questions for you unless you think there's anything that I haven't asked that you want to tell us. 
you're asking a writer to volunteer information. That's never going to happen. Uh, no, I can't think of anything, but thank you very much for talking to me. I'd like to give you the opportunity, and generally everyone always says no, but, you know, at least I've asked and I've done my job, so that's fine. <laughs> Fair um, enough. Well, thank you for taking the time. You're very welcome. And would you just like to tell everyone where they can get your books and where they can find out more about you if they'd like to? Uh, I'm on Twitter at NLBro. Um, I'm around on Facebook, or both as myself and with an author page. Um, and Violent Ends, I'll hold it up one last time because it's a great cover, um, is out now in hardback. So it's in all good bookshops and that place over the river that you can buy stuff online. It's available on audiobook and Kindle and it'll be out on paperback later, but it's basically wherever, wherever bookshops are, that's where you'll find it. Fabulous, thank you.